We're in 2 Samuel chapter 11. It's on page 314. If you've got a church Bible, 2 Samuel chapter 11, and Mona is going to come and read for us. Mona, over to you. Good morning, church. Okay, so we're reading 2 Samuel 11. In the springs, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rubber, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the top, on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman washing. Um, the woman was very beautiful and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam and the wife of Uriah, um, the Hittite. Then David sent messages to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanliness. Then she, then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab, send me, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him, asked him how Joab was, how was the soldiers, where and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents and my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, stay here one more day and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And David's invitation, at David's invitation, he ate and drank with him. And David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among, the, among his master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, Put Uriah out in front where the fighting is the fiercest, fierce. then withdraw him, then withdraw from him so that he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at, put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the, men, when the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, when you have finished giving the, king's, the king this account of the battle, the, king, the king's anger may flare up and he may ask you, why did you get so close to the city to fight? Did you know that they would shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, son of Jurabisheth? Didn't a woman drop an upper milestone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did, he, why did you get so close to the wall? If he asked you this, then say to him, moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. The messenger set out and when he arrived, he told David everything Joab had sent him to say. The messenger said to David, the men overpowered us 
and came out against us in the open. But we drove them back to the entrance of the city gate. Then the archers shot arrows at your servants from the wall, and some of the king's men died. Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. David told the messenger, say this to Joab, don't let this upset you. The sword de devours one as well as another. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. <coughs> say this to encourage Joab. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had, brought, had her brought to his house and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Amen. Thank you so much, Mona. Let's just pause for a brief prayer before we look at that passage together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, these are uh, serious and solemn words. We don't want to look at them lightly. We don't want to pretend that we are unaffected by the realities of a passage like this. And so we ask for your help. We pray that you, by your spirit, might be at work in our hearts and our lives, be in the words that I say, be in all of us as we listen, accomplishing what you want to in our lives and our church, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I, I told you last week that the, the next chapters of 2 Samuel, we are flying down the roller coaster of the unraveling of David's kingdom. You might remember that. Shooting down from the, the heights of his triumphs into the, the tragic depths of David's sin. And I hope this morning, as Mona was reading the passage, you got to feel something of the the terrors of the free fall of David's sin. I think that's how we're meant to feel as we hear uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11 is written to shock you, to shock you. It's the, it's the spiritual equivalent of the, you know, in danger of death signs up at the tube stations by the end of the tracks or the pictures of tarred up lungs on the side of cigarette packets which are designed to stop you from buying cigarettes. You know, this is dangerous, is what we're being told. Keep away. You know, look at just how quickly a righteous king can ruin his life. Don't do it. Don't do it, it says. Now, the more I, I read and study this chapter, the more convinced I am that the writer is absolutely laser focused on this. Let, let me try and show you what I mean. We're going we're gonna to jump around the passage a little bit. Um, but let's see first what's missing and then let's have a look at what's there and try and piece this together before having a think about how this applies to us. So notice first, I know this is slightly strange, but notice what's missing from the chapter. Notice what's not here. We're not told, are we, why David didn't go to war with Joab and the rest of the army. I mean, in, in chapter 10, Joab and the mighty men were sent without David. So I think as you read verse one, and in the spring at the time kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. You're not meant to think that this story is just a case of David being in the wrong place at the wrong time. You're not meant to read it like that. I think I've read the story like that before, as if David is somehow a victim of a few poor decisions about what to do with his time. You know, as if only he made some more wise choices about where he was and when he was, then this would never have happened. People do teach the story like that. I've read it like that before myself. I'm convinced that's not the point. David sent Joab to war because going to war was Joab's job. He was the commander of the army. He'd sent him out on his own before. He will send him out on his own again later. Sometimes David does seem to go with him and sometimes he doesn't. It's not a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's more serious than that. Notice as well though, there's no real detail of the encounter with Bathsheba, not really. David himself doesn't actually speak in the passage until verse six. Bathsheba herself only says three words at the end of verse five, only two words in the original Hebrew. Nothing of what you ex might expect to know or want to know is here. There's no detail about how people felt. We've got no idea how complicit or otherwise Bathsheba is in what happened. We'll talk more about that in a moment. 
We've got no idea about how Joab felt being told to sacrifice one of his top 30 soldiers. Even Uriah the Hittite doesn't indicate whether or not he has any inclination of what David is up to or wondering why he's been sent so close to the wall. I mean, Uriah would have known something. Like, why am I being stationed? What? Why am I being stationed there? I'm one of the best soldiers. What am I doing there? It's like when uh, Jude Bellingham the other night shook his head when he was supposed to be being substituted. No, not me. I'm not coming off, not me. It's one of the other ones. You're either Hittite must have been like that. Not me, I'm not going there. One of your easily spent soldiers should go there. But there's nothing of that, is there? We get none of the, the details about people's feelings. We're obsessed with feelings. We think they're the explanation for everything that we do. They're the driver in our story, or so we think. But the, the writer here doesn't think they're that significant. He doesn't even mention them. All of that is missing. Why, why is that missing? Well, because it's not the point. It's not the point. Notice then what detail is here. What is here? Notice we get details like this instead. Bathsheba, verse 4, Bathsheba was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Now, without going into the details of the female, female cycle, the point here is just to underline what actually happened, the details. Think about it. What the writer is telling you here is, listen, what you need to understand about Bathsheba, before the encounter with David, she was not pregnant, but she was afterwards. So there's no glossing over here what happened. David had sex with another man's wife and got her pregnant. You're meant to see that clearly. Then there's this long encounter with Uriah when David tries to persuade him to go home to see his wife, to cover over what he's done. There's more detail here than anywhere else. This gets way more words than the adultery. The NIV have entitled the chapter, haven't they? David and Bathsheba. But really the writer is telling us more about David and Uriah. And notice how he tells that story. In verse 8, David tells Uriah, go down to your house, he says. But in verse 9, Uriah refuses, I am not going to go down. He says, I'm not going down to my house. In verse 10, the NIV doesn't include it, but the word down is there again. And the, the, the downness is really, in some ways, a metaphor for the whole story. David himself has slumped to new depths, and he is trying to persuade Uriah to go down to the same depth. But he can't persuade Uriah to go anywhere near as low. You know, David is down, down, down in the story, and Uriah is up, up, upright in the story. David is trying to cover his sin while Uriah is being openly righteous at every single turn. Maybe the best place to see the, the laser focus of the chapter is the, the three words that are used to describe what David does. We're told he saw, he took, he lay. Verse 2, he saw David noticed from his rooftop that a beautiful woman was bathing in the courtyard of her home. Then having worked out who it was, in verse 4, he literally, he took or he seized. Our NIV translation uses the word get, but the Hebrew is seize, and the verb applies to David, not so much the servants. You know, they, they go and do the deed, but it's David who is seizing the woman through them. He is taking her, taking someone who does not belong to him. Despite having been told in verse 3 that she's the wife of someone else, someone David would almost certainly have known personally because Uriah the Hittite was one of his best soldiers. And still we're told David took what was not his. Now, like I said before, how willing or complicit Bathsheba was is not the writer's point. There is no detail here about Bathsheba. It would certainly, I think, be fair to say that she would be compelled to come when the king asked her to because of who he was summoning her. There's definitely a massive power imbalance between David and Bathsheba in the story. But we're not told at what point David's intentions were clear to Bathsheba or what she said or whether she objected because that is not the point of the story. The point of the story is all about David and his sin. He saw and he took and then, verse 4, he slept with her, or literally, he lay with her. Or, as we would put it in English, he had sex with her. And then she returns to her house before sending the message at the end of verse 5, I am pregnant. Now, think about the time scale here as well, as we notice the detail of what is here. The opening four verses cover David's encounter with Bathsheba. Then there's at least a month's break until verse 5. And then what follows in the rest of the chapter takes place over the course of probably several weeks. 
with verse 27 happening nine months later. The point is with all of that is that you're not to think that David just somehow tripped up. This is a one-time mistake. Instead, over a period of weeks, maybe months, he is adding sin on top of sin, on top of sin, on top of sin. Horror is being added to horror in an attempt to, over, uh, to cover over horror itself. Then there's this detail of Uriah carrying his death sentence to the front line. It, it's, it's a really excruciating detail, isn't it? Uriah is holding in his hand the note that is telling him he is going to be killed. Uriah is the innocent one carrying the sentence of death, a death that really David deserves for his sin. The penalty in Old Testament Israel for adultery is death. But there's one more thing the writer wants us to notice. So he finishes with what is essentially a bit of a play on words. So if you look at when David hears that Uriah is dead in verse 25, he tells the messenger to tell Joab, don't let this uh, upset you, he says. Literally, the, the, the sense is there, uh, Joab, don't let this be bad in your eyes. You know, don't let this you know, be a bad thing that you're looking at. Tell Joab, just don't worry about it too much. You know, uh, People die in war. This is what happens, Joab. Just, just overlook it. It doesn't matter. Don't let, this, you know, don't let this upset you. But then at the end of the story, we're told using the same word that the thing that David do, uh, had done displeased the Lord. Literally, same word. It was bad in his eyes. In other words, God, you know, David tells Joab, don't look at this. Don't look at this too much. Don't let it displease you. God, on the other hand, is looking at it and it's displeasing him. It's bad in God's eyes. Uh, this, I think, is the laser focus of the passage. Let me try and give you the passage in, in nine words, right? This is the focus of the passage. David is a sinner and God sees it all. Yeah, it's no more complicated than that. While Joab is destroying the Ammonites, David is being destroyed by the desires of his own heart. And despite all his attempts to cover it up, still David is a sinner and God sees it all. And really that's the key turning point in the book of 2 Samuel. From here on in, David's family life is plunged into chaos. Children end up raping and killing each other, stealing the kingdom from him briefly. And all it takes is these three little verbs, saw, took, lay, boom, disaster. It's all it needed. Now, if that's the story in brief, let me just draw out three implications for us, all of which I think I've already mentioned, but all of which are worth more detailed consideration. The first one is this, which we've covered with the children. Sin comes from within. Sin comes from within. Let's just try and get our heads around this fact, because this is really central to our understanding of 2 Samuel 11. David is under no compulsion here. He is not being made to do this by any external force. He does not need to do it. Without being too crude about it, David is not sexually frustrated, is he? He has enough wives of his own, but yet still that does not seem to curb this destructive, lustful desire. You know, standing back from the story and considering it, you're meant to look at this and see that David's sin is essentially completely irrational. It's totally irrational. This makes no sense. David is being a fool somehow deep within David in a way that is completely inexplicable by any rational explanation. There is a desire uh, to take what does not belong to him and destroy everything that's precious to him in the same moment, just for a moment's pleasure. And then when it's discovered to go to extreme lengths to try and pretend it never happened. Now, like we saw with the children, Jesus is super clear in the Gospels. This is exactly the same issue with all of us. In that passage that we looked at from Mark chapter 7, uh, he is arguing with the Pharisees who see sin as being an external uh, immorality that gets them dirty on the outside. So they need to kind of wash it off with external obedience and ceremonial washing. But Jesus tells them in really clear ways, listen, if sin was just on the outside and, and something you needed to wash off, then, then maybe ceremonial washing would be enough. But it's not, because sin comes from within, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. 
You see all of those in this chapter, don't you? All of these evils come from inside and defile a person. And so with you and so with me. Our problem is not that sin is out there looking to get us. Our problem is that it is in here waiting for the opportunity to display itself. And that means that really that the terror of 2 Samuel chapter 11 is not so much that David is a sinner and God sees it all. The the horror of 2 Samuel chapter 11 is that, that Steve is a sinner and God sees it all. You are a sinner and God sees it all. I am a sinner and God sees it all. All. Let me be really clear. David does not have a monopoly on the ruinous power of sin that you see in 2 Samuel 11. Seeing, taking and laying are just a powerful agent of destruction today as they ever were. And for us, we don't need to be on a balcony overlooking uh, the house of a beautiful woman, do we? All we need is an internet connection. And still this irrational, self-destructive desire for sexual pleasure destroys marriages, childhoods, churches, friendships, mental, even physical health. And though we're trained by our hookup culture to believe it doesn't matter and it doesn't hurt, the evidence to the contrary is all around us. And probably there isn't a person in this room who is unaffected by it. Some of you deeply. It's terrifying, isn't it? If you refuse the warning of David's sin here, if you you don't reckon with the fact that inside of your heart, like David's, is an irrational desire not only to break God's law and do what you know to be wrong, but an irrational desire that will hurt you and hurt the people around you. If you don't reckon with that, you've not understood 2 Samuel chapter 11, and I suggest to you, you don't know yourself. We've got to take this seriously. Let me linger here for a moment. I know this is unpleasant, but it's really helpful for us. It's helpful for me. Let's linger here for a moment and make sure we're really clear. Theologians talk about three P's of sin, okay? It's penalty, it's power, and it's presence. It's penalty, it's power, and it's presence. The penalty is the justice that our sins deserve before a holy God. Every sin that we commit, and even the bent of our hearts away from God, that deserves a penalty from a God of justice. The power of our sin is the the hold that it has on us, over us, that our lives are shaped by hearts that desire to live for ourselves and not by the Lord Jesus, so that we we cannot but sin in a sense. And the presence is the fact that not only that we live amidst sin around us, but also that we live internally amidst our sin. We live in the presence of sin in our hearts. Now, if you're a Christian this morning, if you've turned to Christ, repented of your sins, put your hope and trust and confidence in Christ alone, then you need to know, don't you, that your penalty before sin, uh, for sin before God has been paid through Jesus Christ on the cross. There is no more penalty to face. If we sin, we still face the consequences of it in our lives, but the penalty for sin before a just God has been paid through Christ on the cross. There is a sense, too, that you have been, as a Christian, freed from the power of sin. Actually, God, by the Spirit, comes to regenerate our hearts, to make us new, to write the law of God on our hearts so that we we long to love God and trust him and live for him in a way that we didn't before. So that God is transforming us from the inside out, liberating us from the power of sin. We have been freed. But the truth is we still live in the presence of sin don't we? Even as Christians. So much so that in many ways our Christian lives are shaped around a battle with the ongoing presence of sinful desire in our hearts and the actions that come from that. We live our Christian lives increasingly relying on Jesus and his sacrifice for our sin. Now if that's right, if this three-stage definition is helpful, which it is, then it means, doesn't it, brothers and sisters, that you and I are well able to do what David does here. Well able. And we need to be beware. And one of the ways that God makes us wary, one of the ways that God keeps us safe from the ongoing presence of sin in our lives, one thing that he does is he shocks us. He shocks us, telling stories like this in the Bible so that you and I can see what would happen. That fight with sexual temptation, it's a powerful fight, isn't it? It's a a difficult fight, it's a tough fight. It's a fight that we all face, whether we're single or whether we're married. This desire to be sexually active outside of marriage in ways which we know to be wrong and inappropriate, that is a battle that we all face. We all are fighting for sexual purity, but we are fighting it not because God is a killjoy, but because we know deep in our hearts that sexual sin will explode our lives and ruin those around us. 
And many of us in this room know that only too well. Sin comes from within. I am a sinner and God sees it all. Secondly then, sin is an offence to the God who sees. Again, we've seen this already, but it needs to be thought about some more. We discover, don't we, all along that though David has been trying to hide his sin, uh, God has been an observer. And not only a kind of passive, distant observer, but also an observer who is passing judgment. He has displeased God, and we'll find out more about that uh, when David meets Nathan in chapter 12. It's worth, I think, considering, though, why is it that that David spent so much time in this chapter trying to cover up sin? I mean, I'm sure if you sat down with David and and had a conversation with him before the events of 2 Samuel 11, you said, listen, David, I want just to ask you a very important question. Do you believe that this God who you worship, who you believe has made you a promise, do you believe that that God knows what's going on in your life? What would David say? Oh, yeah, of course I do. Yeah, I know that. David, do you believe that God sees what you do? Oh, yeah, yeah, I definitely believe that. Yeah, God's been been involved in my life all along. I I know that he sees everything I do. Now, Now, if David believes that, why on earth is he spending so much time, so much energy trying to cover over his sin? Well, I think it's for sure, for one, because he's proud and he's sneaky. He wants to cover over his tracks in front of other people. But when you think about it, his instinct to cover over his immorality is almost as irrational as the adultery is in the first place. David, what are you doing? Do you really think this is going to be successful? You surely understand that God knows. I think we're to understand that the reason David tries to cover over his sin here, the reason that you and I also go to great lengths to try and cover over our sin is because this, it's the only thing we can do with sin. It's the only tool we have to fight against sin, is to pretend that we are better than we really are. It's like uh, pulling the rug over the stain on the carpet, isn't it? Hiding the consequences as best we can. But 2 Samuel 11 there is to tell you that it's a hopeless task because the one who really matters, the, the, the one whose job it is to hold this world to account, that person, that one, God himself looks on us and sees and knows, says 2 Samuel chapter 11. Worth noting that the passage is really super clear on this. We're not told, are we, what anyone else thought, yeah? We're not told whether anyone else worked out what was going on. We don't know what Uriah the Hittite thought. We're not told what David's palace servants thought when they presumably must have known what was going on. We're not sure what Joab himself thought. You know, imagine opening the letter going, uh, please sacrifice one of your 30 best men. What, really, why? Really, in a sense, that's not there because that's not what really matters. Listen, if you this morning have been particularly successful at covering over your sin so that nobody else in this room, nobody else in your family knows what's really going on in your life. Let me say to you, if that's what you're doing, well, congratulations, you've deceived no one who really matters because the God who sees knows. Sin is an offense to the God who sees. And as much as we try and suppress it or ignore it, we know deep in our hearts, don't we, that this is true. We live in a world, don't we, where there is right and wrong, where there is a God who made us to live in a certain way, and where we all know that taking something, and especially someone that doesn't belong to us, is not right. We live in a world where sex has been made for the marriage of one man to one woman, and where to break that covenant is serious. And it's not just because of the pain that it causes or the mess that it makes, or because it's going to not lead to the best outcomes for David. It's actually just because it's not right. It's not right because God says it's not right. And although David kills to cover it up, still he cannot hide it from the all-seeing God. Let me say that this instinct to cover up is really a big sign that your Bible is true, yeah? How how do you know that what you read here is, is true, that the Bible is true? Maybe you're not a Christian this morning, or you're not sure whether you're a Christian, or you're not really just taking the Christian life very seriously, because you're not sure it's very important. Let me suggest to you that you consider, just for a brief moment, your guilt, Yes, we all feel guilty, don't we? We might not always feel guilty about the right things in the right way, and some of us might be more sensitive than others, but still, guilt is a very, very hard emotion to explain if we're not made by a God of justice and morality who will one day hold us to account. 
You know, why, if God is not real, if judgment is not to come, if you won't stand before the Lord one day on an account, why, why if none of those things are true, why do you still delete your internet history? Huh? Why? Why do you not let people read your messages? Why are you so secretive about what you read or what you watch or how you think? You know, we might fool our friends or our family or our church, but we don't fool God because he sees and he knows, and you and I know it in our hearts, in the emotion of guilt. Finally, though, we need a king that does not sin. We need a king that does not sin. Uh, there's a horror to the passage because it descends so fast into the chaos, and there's very little light in 2 Samuel chapter 11. There's very little gospel hope here to see. And I think as readers, we're, we're meant not only to be convicted of our own weakness and our own sin, that we too could be like David, and we've seen that together, but we're also supposed to see, aren't we, that as God's people, we're going to need someone who is better than David. You know, David is a massive disappointment in 2 Samuel chapter 11 for all the promise of the guy who beat Goliath, yeah? You read that story, you think, wow, that's going to be a great king. He is going to be brilliant. And then he becomes king, and he's a massive letdown. You know, we're told that uh, David is a man after God's heart as Samuel anoints him as king. But really, he is no more able to fix the world even than Saul because he's a sinner. And really the terror of all that is meant to bring in us an ache, an ache not just that we're like David and oh, I do this too, or I fall in these same ways. We're not only meant to feel that kind of ache, but we think, oh goodness, Lord, there's got to be a better king for your people. We need a king who will not be undone by indwelling sin. We need one who can be tempted, but smash through temptation and come out on the other side. And of course, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, God, the eternal son, born in human flesh as a man, come to rule and reign as the bringer of God's kingdom, king of God's people. You see, in a way, Jesus is the exact reversal of 2 Samuel chapter 11. You know, take those devastating three verbs of David's life, that the saw took lay. David saw and he lusted. He took for himself what was not his. He lay with Bathsheba when he knew that was wrong. Jesus saw us. Not in lust-fueled greed, but in gracious compassion, laid bare in the nakedness of our sin, with all the dark motives of our heart exposed before him, yet still he saw us and loved us. He took to himself what was not his. Not in an action of selfish desire, but in an act of self-giving love. He takes on himself our sin and the judgment that it deserves. He lays, he lays down his life on a cross. And God sees Jesus doing those things, seeing, taking, and laying down his life. And God looks at that and goes, I am pleased with that. Delighted in King Jesus. And this makes Jesus the opposite of David. But there's another picture of Jesus in this passage as well. Incredibly, Jesus is like Uriah in the passage. Uriah is innocent though provoked, remains steadfast even though lured towards sin. Then dying, as the righteous one to cover over the sins of the wicked. And this is Jesus, isn't it? Jesus is the righteous one, the one who was provoked but never gave in, steadfast in the face of temptation, carrying a death sentence with him, written not on a note by David to carry to Joab, but written in a cross, carried up a hill outside Jerusalem, his life in place of our life, the righteous for the wicked to truly cover over our sin. Listen, if you're, if you're not a Christian this morning, I have to tell you that you must reckon with guilt. You must, you have to. Who is going to pay for that guilt that you feel? Someone has to pay. And David tried to make Uriah pay for it, but it doesn't work. That moral debt that you owe has to be paid. But I'm here to tell you there is a willing Uriah, a better king than David, one who will give himself for you to lay down his life in your place that you might be forgiven. And if you're a Christian this morning, this passage is written, yes, as a warning, reminding us that we're not finally rid of the presence of sin until we meet Christ in glory. And until that day, we must keep fighting sin. We must keep trusting in Jesus as Lord that he is a better king. But the light and the hope in the passage is that Jesus is gloriously and wonderfully better than King David. You and I live in a better kingdom than David's. We have sharper tools to fight sin with. We have a clearer understanding of the grace of God written in the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. 
we have a willing Uriah for our sin. One who actually is able to cover over our sin and deal with it at the cost of his own life. Forgiving our sin and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. Well, let's pray as I finish and before we sing. Let's have a moment of quiet, maybe just to reflect in our own hearts. Maybe if you're a Christian this morning, you want to just actually say sorry to the Lord for the ways that you have sinned against him. Maybe if you're not a Christian, this is a time for you to commit your life to the Lord. Let's have a few moments of quiet. Loving Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We do not want to pretend that we are anything other than what you know us to be. You see everything that we do. You see everything that we think. You know everywhere that we've been. There is not a thought or an attitude or an action that you do not see. And Lord, we confess that like David, we sin and displease you but we come in the name of jesus the perfect king who gave his life to cover over our sins and we trust in him please lord we pray might you increasingly give us zeal in this fight this battle especially with sexual temptation we pray help us we ask not to be lured by a moment of pleasure for a lifetime of disaster Please, Lord, give us strength and courage and confidence in you. Fill us again with your spirit that we might live lives which please and honour you. And we pray just as we consider together your word and as we think through it as we leave from here, may you please continue by your spirit to do that work amongst us, bringing glory to your name, transforming us and changing us in ways that only you can. And we pray this for your glory and in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.